It is the late afternoon, November morning, 333 BC. Nearby the small coastal town of Issus, Persian King Darius III deployed his army to the north of the Panaris River. His position cut off the communication and supply lines for Alexander the Great's army, which had been marching south along the coastline. In the distance, he saw Alexander's army march towards him. Word reached Alexander that the Persian king's army was approaching. He was at risk of having his supply lines cut off and being enveloped in incredibly hostile territory. As they deployed in front of the Persians, they knew their only way out was to emerge victorious. The alternative was a bitter fight to the death. The fate of two great rulers hung in the balance as the two sides prepared to clash with all the ferocity of ancient warfare. After Alexander's victory at the Battle of the Granicus, the road into Persia lay open to him. He marched his army south, liberating many Greek cities along Asia's west coast. Persian-oriented oligarchs and tyrants had ruled these cities. In most cases, the city's rulers fled when they learned of Alexander's approach. The Persian commander of Sardis, Metrines, surrendered to Alexander voluntarily. Down the line, his reward for his meek surrender would be the governorship of Armenia. Several cities fiercely resisted Alexander, however, partly because they preferred the devil they knew to the devil they didn't, but also because Memnon of Rhodes, who Darius had now appointed as commander of the western satrapies, and the Persian fleet prevented them from opening their gates. Miletus and Halicarnassus were the two main strongholds fiercely resisting Alexander's advance. Miletus enjoyed support from the Persian fleet. Commander of Alexander's companion cavalry, Philetus, moved to occupy Mikali, depriving the ships of a base. The city was taken soon after, but Halicarnassus was a tougher nut to crack. Defended by Memnon of Rhodes and Orombates, Alexander initially attempted diplomacy to seize the city, unsuccessfully so, and soon he built a series of earthworks around the city while bombarding it with his artillery. After a fierce battle where the Macedonian infantry stormed the city, its commander set fire to it and abandoned it. Much of the city was destroyed in the ensuing inferno, but Alexander was, again, victorious. After liberating the Greek cities on the west coast, Alexander's army planned to march through the inland of Asia Minor. Until this moment, he maintained a 160-strong fleet of triremes. Maintaining this fleet was expensive, and the Persian fleet outnumbered his at least 3 to 1. The king decided he could not win a naval battle against Persia, and the finances were better spent on marching through the inland of Asia Minor. He disbanded his fleet, only retaining the Athenian fleet mainly to secure his army supply lines. Disbanding the fleet allowed the Persians to raid the Greek mainland and potentially cut off the army from Asia Minor a situation not entirely unthinkable. But Alexander reasoned, his soldiers fought better, knowing a retreat was impossible. His strategy was to conquer the Persian and Phoenician bases along the coastline as his army passed. It was a very ambitious and bold plan. Several high-ranking commanders abandoned the young king, who was struck down by fever during this time. Meanwhile to the east, King Darius had been frantically augmenting his army. He collected an army the size of which the world had rarely seen before. They marched from Babylon to meet Alexander on the Anatolian Peninsula. This imperial army consisted of Iranian cavalry, Mesopotamian infantry, and around 30,000 Greek mercenaries. Alexander's historians, Curtius, Justin, Diodorus, and Arian, place a number of soldiers between 312,000 and 600,000. Meanwhile, Alexander recovered from his fever and continued his march eastward. At Gordium, a new challenge awaited him. The Gordian knot was a legendary knot that was said to have been tied by the ancient Phrygian King Gordius. According to legend, an oracle had predicted that the person who untied the knot would become the ruler of Asia. 
The knot was extremely complex and intricate, and many people had tried, and failed, to untie it. Legend has it that instead of untying it, Alexander used his sword to simply cut the knot. He was on his way to becoming Asia's ruler. Meanwhile, Memnon energetically tried to rouse support for a rebellion in Alexander's rear. Sparta was already preparing for a war, and the Athenian faction reportedly planned to rise up. But then Memnon died during the siege of Mytilene, the base of Persia's fleet. His untimely death caused any naval and insurrection strategies to at least briefly reach a standstill. Barnabasus replaced him as commander of the Persian fleet. Energetically looking for allies against Alexander, he met with Spartan king Aegis to instigate a rebellion in the Peloponnese. Darius's scouts learned Alexander traversed the Taurus mountain range, capturing Tarsus soon after. His army was not fully capable and equipped yet, but the Persian king felt time was of the essence. His army had encamped at Sochi. Initially, Darius wanted to remain here because the Syrian plain allowed him to use his superior numbers to his full advantage. But when Parmenion captured Issus, and Alexander passed through it, leaving Issus as a base for his sick and wounded, the Persian king decided a perfect opportunity to cut off his foe presented itself. He circled around Alexander's army, cutting them off from their base at Issus. The Macedonian king was surprised to learn the armies' position were now reversed. With hostile territory to his south, Alexander could do nothing but turn around and fight. The armies met a few miles south of Issus. The number of troops both armies fielded is a matter of dispute. Darius likely outnumbered Alexander. He fielded up to 100,000 soldiers, although the accounts of Arian and Plutarch estimated as high as 600,000. Among them were 11,000 cavalry, 10,000 immortals, and 10,000 Greek mercenaries. Alexander only fielded between 30 and 40,000 soldiers. Around 24,000 of them were heavy infantry, 13,000 light infantry, and up to 6,000 cavalry. Darius deployed his army on a coastal plain to the north of the Panaris River. His army spanned approximately three miles. Most inexperienced troops manned the Persian left and right. The vanguard consisted of a line of archers. The center consisted of 2,000 royal bodyguards, Darius's elite soldiers. He commanded them from among their ranks, situated in a great ornamental chariot. The royal bodyguards were flanked by around 30,000 Greek mercenary phalanx and 60,000 hand-picked infantrymen, so-called kardakas, professional heavy infantry. These deployed around the Greek mercenaries. The royal cavalry stood near the king. To the far right stood the heavy Persian cavalry, south of the Gulf of Issus. Far in the hills, to his left, Darius dispatched a detachment of light infantry to flank around Alexander's right flank. By late afternoon, Alexander's army arrived at the scene. The young king noticed the Persian cavalry concentrated to their right flank near the shore. With the Persian cavalry facing his left flank, Alexander figured it was best to deploy his Thessalonian cavalry to augment that flank instead of their original right position. His phalanx infantry manned the center. Everything to their left was commanded by Permenian. The cavalry initially remained behind the phalanx, concealing their movement. His companion cavalry, an elite cavalry unit, augmented the right flank, restricted in their movement by the hills. To the far right stood Agrianians, a Trashian tribe, together with archers and lightly armed infantry. Realizing the Persian infantry flanked him from the hills, Alexander ordered the Agrianians to stop them in their tracks. The soldiers skirmished in the hills and would not play a role during the actual battle. Darius's cavalry on the right flank opened the battle. They launched a charge crossing the river against Parmenion and his cavalry. Despite the ferocious charge, Parmenion bravely resisted. As the cavalry fought, Alexander ordered the remainder of his army forward. His goal was for Parmenion to hold out against the Persian cavalry long enough 
for Alexander's right wing to beat the Persians and mop up the remainder of the enemy. Instead, things did not go well for Alexander's army. As the phalanx advanced and crossed the river, they struggled up its fortified bank. Beyond the bank, Greek mercenaries stood at the ready to fight them. Arian describes how near instantly 120 Macedonians of note were slain and the phalanx was forced to retreat. As this was ongoing, the cavalry on the left was slowly pushed back by the strong and aggressive Persian cavalry. But Alexander and his Hippaspis also launched a charge. They faced the Kardakis. Brutal close combat broke out. Despite both type of soldiers being professionals, the Hippaspists appear to best the Kardakis. Cracks emerged among the Persian line where Alexander and his Hippaspists fought. To his far right, his infantry made inroads against the Persian skirmishers. During the brutal fighting going on, Alexander mounted a horse and led his companions in a charge against Darius. According to Plutarch, Alexander had an encounter with Darius. In this action, he received a sword wound in the thigh. According to Carries, this was given him by Darius, with whom he engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. After the battle, Alexander sent a letter to Antipater describing it but making no mention of who had given him the wound. He said no more than that he had been stabbed in the thigh with a dagger and the wound was not a dangerous one. The companion charge against the Persian bodyguards was ferocious. The lines wavered and some of the most battle-hardened Persian bodyguard broke. Darius too turned around and decided it would be best to leave the battlefield. Instead of pursuing the king, Alexander understood the left and center was in trouble. The Greek mercenaries continued the bitter fight against the Macedonian phalanx in the center. The broken Persian corps freed up resources to reinforce the struggling phalanx. Alexander created enough room for his Macedonian cavalry to move freely, despite the terrain being very narrow. He launched a charge against the rear of the Greek mercenaries in the center. Despite retaining the upper hand against the Macedonian phalanx, a charge to their flank and rear definitely turned the tide. Many mercenaries broke, and if they could, they fled. Any other Persian soldier still engaged in combat realized the king had fled and most flanks were being overrun. The army deteriorated into a full-blown rout. Alexander ordered his cavalry to pursue the fleeing soldiers for as long as daylight allowed them to. It is estimated the Persians lost around 20,000 soldiers although generous estimates put the number at over 100,000 lost, among whom 10,000 cavalry by Arian, Curtius and Plutarch. Justin gives the same total with a breakdown of 61,000 foot, 10,000 horse and 40,000 captured. The disparity between these figures and the reported Macedonian losses of less than 500 men is difficult to rhyme with a realistic scenario. It is more likely Alexander's army lost around 7,000 soldiers. When the Persian king fled, he left behind his ornate chariot, cloak, shield and bow. Alexander captured his battle camp, including his mother, wife and two daughters. The victory at Issus was Alexander's second major victory on Persian territory, but it was not decisive. Up to 10,000 Greek mercenaries managed to escape and the Persian king fled into his empire's heartland to assemble yet another army. The victory did allow Alexander to move his campaign to the south. He set his eyes on Egypt. Now, Alexander's goal was to solidify his grip on his newly acquired territories. He appointed his own satraps, Antigonus the One-Eyed, a certain Ptolemy, and Balacras. These were meant to crush any dissent behind the front lines. To acquire even more legitimacy, he married one of Darius's daughters, Stateira. News of his victory at Issus traveled far and wide and Alexander was far from done with his conquest. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a person, topic, battle or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and all my channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon.